Hey everyone, we're in the Trade 99 Rig Studios here, kicking off with our first video. We're gonna do a rig rundown. I know a lot of you have been wanting to see this. Um, so I thought we'd start here. This is my friend Andrew. He kindly brought his Languidoc here. What year is this one? Uh, I, 11? 2011, 2011, I think. 2011, yeah. And I think it's maple, right? Yep. Yeah, so I think it, this one's stained copper. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a beautiful piece. Um, these are obviously made by Paul Languidoc, if you're not familiar with these guitars. Um, this is a 2020 model that Paul built in the summer of 2020, and this is a maple top with a paduke back and sides, and holly binding. He used to do plastic binding. You have a plastic binding one, right? I do. I have another mm -hmm. one that's got plastic binding like early tray guitars, uh, where it goes like white, black, white, black, white, black, white. So it's, oh, right, it's like yeah. a thicker there. Uh, plastic poses some challenges over time though because it shrinks a little bit and it's been a bit of a problem. This one, the copper one, has been far more stable with the... Yeah, this has curly maple wood binding. Yeah, I think so, he, he used to charge extra for it, right? I think so, yeah. The, the wood on wood, the whole thing kind of moves together in the, in the humidity and so we don't get like cracking and checking. Uh, the other one that I have has a bunch of checking, which is actually kind of cool over time. Like, I don't mind it, um, but it does have that and the story is like, so do Trey's early guitars. They all have checking all over. Yeah, them. that 96 one he has is like completely beaten to, beaten to crap. Um, but yeah, let me show you the, uh, the controls here. So this is the pretty much standard wiring. I think they changed it around GD50 in 2015, but these are Seymour Duncan 59s um, and they're humbuckers, obviously. So, you know, you get a nice fat sound from both. So this is your neck. And then you've got your coil tapping, I think up, up is the outer coils. So this gives you your, this is just this pickup. This is both. And then this is your uh, neck. And then this is your inners. And obviously you're back in humbucking mode. And this one is uh, this one is kind of like a boost, I think he calls it. Mm -hmm. This turns both pickups on and it becomes like one giant pickup. But I don't remember what the pickup selector does. But it's it does like, nothing. Well, I think, does it, it do, in that oh, case, this, it doesn't do anything. Oh yeah, this doesn't do anything. Yeah, but this still works. I think it's just, just, this, just this pickup. Yeah, you'll actually see uh, a tray has it removed on his yeah, guitars. Yeah, yeah. Like he, he, he never uses it, so, but yeah. It's a great guitar. Um, hollow body, of course, um, fully hollow and braced. Uh, super cool. And then um, cable runs out. And then this is one of the things I always wondered in Trey's rig when I was researching all this was what, what's the first piece of gear, uh, you know, that his guitar hits. And... You know, I always wonder what this big box was and like the rack back here. So I did a lot of research and actually found out the Whammy, the Whammy 2 here is actually what he uh, first plugged into. So it's a Whammy 2. I think he started using it in 94, but it's got all the normal sounds. So there's no switching for this. Like it's no, just so straight in and then yeah, you bypass it or turn it off. Yeah, exactly. So the, the Whammy is its, is its own, you know, it's in the loop. It has its own bypass. It's a little noisy. So you can hear the hiss when I turn it on, but. And then you can hear a lot of old fish tunes with that. Where he does that kind of like cycling through. Yep, so after the whammy, we go into an old Ernie Ball volume pedal. So he started using this, I think in the 80s. Uh, he doesn't use it anymore, but it gives you that kind of like. Kind of like that Esther sounds. Yeah. Uh, and also he would use it a lot for like uh, volume swells, like for you enjoy myself. Okay. So like 
in that spacey section of you enjoy myself. Yeah, it's got a little, I need to deox it, but it's got a little scratch in it. But you get the idea. So yeah, a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, and then into the wah. So this gives you your, this is a classic crybaby. Again, there's a whole myth about him using a, I think it's a Tease or something. Or the RMC3, the real McCoy. I, I thought he had a custom audio electronics version, like a Bob Bradshaw version. He does, he does now, but okay. back in the 90s, okay. he always used a crybaby. At least that's what he says. Pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and then we have our tube screamers. So a lot of people ask me about this. They're always like are using the analog man modded ones and all that stuff. Uh, but he, from what I can tell, he didn't he didn't use the analog man ones until the 2002 2003 04 okay. era. So these are the stock TS nines. This one here. This one's just the light distortion. So. <laughs> And then you've got like second tube scream, right? Yeah, so then the second one's set on full scream, so it's like. And then you could do, yeah, you could do both, both together, which is yeah, like which super. I, I don't know how often he did that, but that's when you're like. That yeah, like yeah, yeah. Divided like sky ripping. stuff. Ripping. Yeah, that's only you're going full bore. And, and then into the compressor. Yeah, so we go to Ross. So this is uh, the famous Ross compressor that I'm pretty sure Trey made famous. This one's yeah. from 1979. Um, and I've looked at tons of pictures. Right. And... Uh, Basically, he usually has the level right around noon, or maybe like one or two, and the sustain fairly low. But okay. the idea is, yeah, you get that kind of like a crispy sound. So it's on all the time. Yeah, it's on all the time. He never okay. turned it off. He has it racked now in his modern rig, but basically, um, I think I think he has it in its own loop, and he can turn it on sure. when he wants it, but. Yeah, back in the like 80s and 90s, that thing was on all the time. So then you run out of there. Yep, so now we go into there and then over here to the rack. So this is our uh, custom audio electronics rack. Yeah, so basically what these are uh, right here are, they're called loopers. And, don't, and I don't want to get people confused with uh, audio loopers, which are a different thing, um, which is like basically like a repeating you know, box that repeats stuff like the boomerang, which we'll talk about. But these are what are called audio loops, basically, in controllers. And I think it came out of like the 80s when a lot of like rack gear mm -hmm. um, was a big thing. And the, the whole idea is basically just to like, you don't want to have all of your, your, your guitar signal going through like all these extra pieces of gear that are in this rack. So what you do is you put them in their own loops. And then this big pedal right here is, there's no, I used to think, I, was, I used to wonder if like audio went through this box. Right. And it doesn't. It's literally just like a big remote control that controls these two things by an old technology called MIDI that's still in use. Um, but yeah, the, the whole idea is basically like, you know, keep everything clean unless you want it uh, in the chain. So the first effect in this chain is the DM2000, which Trey has said he's had since like high school. It's one of the first, I think it's from like 1983. And this gives you, you know, your just basic delay. He used to do the... Uh, <laughs> Or the, uh, you know, your ghost funk siren loop. Oops. So the problem is you can't. Once so how you, do you clear it? Like, you how, right? You can't clear yeah, it. The, the problem is it's an old, really old delay, so you can't just be like cancel that. So you, you have had to like be, let it go. You had to be super precise with his, uh, with his loops. Yeah. So yeah, you basically. So what he would have to do is like turn the loop off, keep playing, and let it fade out. Wow. You, what you could do, I guess, is you could turn the feedback knob. Okay. Right. To and it clear would just speed it. up. Yeah. So what's the, well, there was some benefit to this unit, like it has infinite delay or it has yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, so, so the basically, you know, if you think back to the old, um, the old 
ghosts of 97, 98. You okay. Know, it starts with the the this, and then what he would do is he kind of let it decay a little bit. Right. He would he would do a bunch of those loops, let it decay, and then he would hit this button called hold, and what that's doing is it's turning on this button, this function. And right that here. never disappears. Yeah, now. then it just keeps looping, okay. just like an audio loop. Okay. So, right, that, so then he could play, you know, his he could play his like chunky. That's your ghost. Okay. That's the yep. old way they used to play okay. it. Yeah, and then um, the cool thing with that too is like, and then if you want to add more to it, you just hit unhit hold and then okay. the buffer is open again. Okay, so you can add stuff and then hold it again if yep. you want. Okay, that is Yeah, so cool. if I wanted to add like a... Okay. Yep. So it's basically like, it'll just keep going forever. So he, he loves that feature. And then there's the thing called the mod feature, which you'll hear still. And it kind of does this like... Oh, thing. it's like a... Okay. Yeah, and he, and then, and he used to do this. Okay. It's kind of goofy, but he used to do it a lot more in the 90s. Or in the, like, 94. Otherwise, it's just doing this sine wave. Yeah, it's kind of doing, like, like a, it's a pitch sweep, but no, there's nothing, nothing on the market that can do that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And he actually, he still uses it. It's kind of... It's really bizarre. Yeah. And it's... Let me see if I can get it. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you get something cool out of it. But yeah, so that that's the the DM two thousand. He still has it in his rig. It's one of the, like the oldest things he has. Uh, you can still find them on on like Reverb and eBay. They're like two hundred bucks. But some of them are kind of like you know, they're from the it's from the eighties. So right. Some of them are in bad shape. Um, and then after that, we go into I think we went to the mic reverb. So this is a little little um, reverse delay that you've heard about. That's this guy here. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's yeah. loop two. Like loop one was the delay. Yeah. So if okay. I turn this Got on, it. You can oh see yeah, that, that yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So if you watch old videos, okay. you can actually see. You can kind of tell what is well, being. That's okay. if you know what loop is assigned to what. But yeah. Okay. So it's actually pretty cool. So on like leads, um, it gives it that. So basically it gives him that like slap back delay. It just gives it that really cool crystalline right. kind of like, I think it just gives it a little bit more space. He did, I don't think he used reverb on his amps, so. Okay. Um, and then, so these other ones I kind of cheated. I don't think he was really using them in 99, but um, this is kind of like that same spacey. Yeah. This, it's not great either. That's this one? That's the middle one, yeah. So it's set for like just a very like huge hall. Okay. I think I think he used that instead of the DM2000. Okay. So he would, he had one called, set on, he called it vast, another one called full. And one was basically like one had more wet. Okay. Or yep. had more dry in the mix than, I don't know. And then th this one I'm still kind of figuring out. This one's full. I think it's just pure wet. That's this Elise is here. Yeah, that's a nanover. Yeah. But I think I think by '99 he had just he just uses the reverse. But he uh, you know he had all three in the rack, so I, I'm just making them work. So those are re the reverbs. The the reverse is really all he. Yeah, that's a key sound. That's like a yeah. And I think like you can hear it on a lot. If you really pay attention, you can hear it on his like his solos and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in '99, and then we have the Univibe. So this is the this is not what he had. This is a, a newer version, but it's basically the same circuit called the Black Cat Vibe. But it gives you that cool. And then 
mixed with the reverse, it's pretty cool. So the, this is actually routing through two units. So the first loops are here, and then the output's going into the input of this and the yeah, back. Yeah, so right? it, yeah, it basically doubles up. So basically it just, you know, the way it all works is it's one big chain still. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so this is the A1, so it all cascades. So it's running through one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. And then, and then yeah, it runs. So I take the output of this unit into the okay. input of this one. So you can do the input on the back of this. So you're doing it on the front, but you could yeah, do it on the back. Okay. exactly. All right. And you can also route everything weirdly. You can run like loop one into loop four. Sure, sure. It's, there's, there are a bunch of weird stuff, but he just, you know. This is just in and out. Yeah, and also like this thing um, has the ability to do what's called, um, you can do like for certain songs like, oh, for Down With Disease, I want these three effects to come on. So like I want like, oh, like pro a patch. Right, yeah, okay. like a patch. But cool. he, he only ever used it in what's called stomp box mode, okay. basically. Okay. Where it's just literally just like stomp boxes here. It's like limiting your, like you said, their signal chain. Like you're not going through all this stuff. Yeah. Even though at this point progression in 99, like you're already <laughs> going through. Like there is some yeah. stuff you're going through. Yeah, you're still going through all this stuff. And, you know, true bypass is a big debate of like, you know, yeah. tone sucking and all that stuff. Sure. But yeah, basically like he had all this stuff just racked, I think, just because he had rack effects. Mm-hmm. Like the mm -hmm. DM2000, he could never use until he got a proper rack and stuff okay. like that. Yep. Um, and he actually, I think in like 96, 90, actually when he initially had it, I think all this stuff was racked. Okay. So the tube streamers were racked, the wah was racked, um, the Ross was racked. So like everything, and he had, he had four of these. Okay. Four of them. Just, again, just cascading and yeah. more like a bigger board for control. Yeah, he had the, an expansion. Okay. They, they, Bradshaw sold an expansion thing. Um, and then, yeah, you would run these like long audio loops out to like your wah pedal and mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think he was finally at the point where he's just like, I just want to get back to a regular pedal board mm -hmm. and then mix with, with rack effects. Um, so I think in like 97, he switched back to this setup just with like the old style tube screamers, wah, Ross and all that stuff. Yep. Um, and then the last effect in here, well, the last rack effect is the tremolo. So it's, it's classic trem, but mostly he used uh, the chop mode. And then he had this rate pedal that he'd use to speed it up. And you, you know, you would know it more from like Frankenstein or something like that. That's awesome. Something like that. Yep. And then, obviously, we'll talk about the amps. Um, so that those are all the effects. And then, basically, what happens is it goes to this amp mainly. This is a 1965 Fender Deluxe Reverb, and. He started using this in the fall of 97, mm -hmm. and it's actually modded. Um, he had it modded by this guy named Bill Carruth up in Vermont. And it has like a very specific set of tubes and a bunch of circuitry changed. And it's supposedly supposed to have like, you know, reverb in both channels, which it does. Right. I think the, cause obviously the, just the, this, just this one has vibrato and reverb in a stock uh, deluxe reverb, but it's modded to have reverb in both, even though I don't use them. And then the, lead channel is supposed to sound more like a tweed amp but i don't really notice any difference between the two so if you do like sounds the same to me because because you the, the gain is set the same on on both well i make the, i just made the lead channel a little bit louder so actually let's explain that for a second because i think you had mentioned you're coming. You come out of this. Yep. And go into this, which is essentially an A B box well, the, with the, lights. Yeah, the signal basically splits out of this. Split, so okay. Yeah, we'll explain. So split one it goes to this amp, which is a Fender combo amp. Um, but it's going through this yeah, A B box going first. To this A B box that I built, and this is a copy of what he he was using. So this was built in 1965. It didn't have channel switching built in. Right. You know, it had two channels. So kind of like a low fi way of doing it is just building an A B box, where you have your main signal coming in. And then you're splitting either, you know, to A or B. So in this case, you're going from rhythm to the lead channel. Okay. So that just means now I'm now in this one. Yep. And when I switch back here, I'm in this one. And both channels, uh, both channels are just on. Yeah, both channels okay. are on. They're just tweaked a little bit different, so they sound different. But yeah, I mean, tonally, they don't sound super different to me, but um, it is kind of cool to have both. That's cool. Uh, but yeah, there's a whole set of tubes that are like specific and... Yeah. 
components swapped out and stuff like that. There's a whole thing of mods that were that was done to it. I had a local tech do it based on what this dude Bill had done back in the 90s to Trey's um, amps. And Trey had three of them, I think. Okay. He had like a primary, a backup, and then he had a third one that I think he used to power the Leslie, but that we'll talk about in a sec. Okay. And then I don't know what speaker he had in there back then. Um, okay. It was either a, I've heard a Celestian Blue, um, a Vintage 30, or I forget what the other one was. But I, what, what I have in there is now, it's called a Celestian Cream. Okay. And it's an 8 ohm, really cool speaker. It's supposed to be like a V30, but just like a little crisper, I guess. I don't know. It sounds good to me though. But it's a great amp. Um, and then the, the second split is actually running into this tuner. So this is just an old Korg rack tuner mm -hmm. he had for years. Um, and then what it's actually doing is it's, they kind of use it as a, a poor man's kind of like, uh, what would you call that? It basically has a, a pass through, an audio pass through. Yep. And then that way they could choose when they sent audio uh, from there to the Mesa amp that powers the Leslie. I know it gets a little oh, confusing. Oh, okay, so it's just a mute. Yeah, it's, it's basically just a mute. So you're gonna control the mute on the tuner to send to this. Yeah. Which is then gonna power the Leslie. Yeah, so basically the way it's gonna work is, Whoa. the way it, it's like audio is always being fed to this box, but it's muting okay. it. Okay, got it, yep. 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 And the, it has its own little mute switch, but I, it's wired up to this foot switch here. It, so there's a there's an input to control the mute on the back of this. Yeah, I think, I think the idea was you would have that in your rack, and then your guitar would plug into it, and then you could mute yeah, the totally. output. Yeah, totally. But they're using it they're as using like a it mute as, for the whole Leslie system. They're, yeah, they're using it okay. as like a pass-through mute, yeah. which was kind of clever. So when I hit this button, it unmutes the audio signal that's also... So the signal's going to here, and it's also going to here, and then now it's unmuted and going to here. Okay. And then that's powering the speaker. So this, this Mesa Boogie is what he used in the 80s. It's a Mark III. I think this one's from like 87. Um, but he, I guess he just needed a power amp or a preamp This was like amp. the main amp yeah. for a long time. And yeah. then, because he's talked about this, I think. Yep. And then it became relegated to being the power amp for the Leslie Yeah, he speaker. literally was just like, okay. I need a good tube okay. amp to power a Leslie. So cool. he went through a bunch of Leslie phases um, and he finally landed on this thing. He used a thing in 95 called an MTI Roto Phaser. I remember that. Yeah, and then uh, you see it in like the Clifford Ball. And then in like 97, he used a thing called a, a Motion Sound Pro 3 or something mm -hmm. like that. And the idea is like these things were made for guitar. And, like if you guys seen a Leslie speaker, it's like a giant. Sure. It's like a small refrigerator with a low, low rotor that's spinning and then a top rotor that's spinning. And then at some point he got this thing. So this is from what's called a Leslie 925, which is like this tall. Mm -hmm. And it's two pieces, so this is just the top part. Okay. And the, the bottom part actually is about as tall as this rack. And, uh, and basically, like, I had no idea how it was, like, modded or anything. Because sure. basically, the way these work is um, it gets all the power and audio and control from that bottom part. Mm -hmm. So I had to find someone to, like, modify it so that I, it could be a standalone. Got it. So I found this, this guy who used to work for Bose. He lives in Massachusetts, and he was able to uh, to do all the mods. He put a crossover in it. Yep. Because it can't take any of the lower frequencies. So it has to cross over at something. Mm -hmm. I think it's like 800 hertz or something like yep. that. And he like refurbed it all. He made this own this little relay control box um, that does the fast slow, mm -hmm. and he, he it has its own little power cord. It's so cool. Um, and if you, if you look at old pictures, you'll definitely see this thing. It's it's like 60 pounds, super heavy. <laughs> He, he used to have it on top here, but in the 99 setup, it was over here. So it transitions from fast to slow. With yeah, so I'll show you. Uh, so it's on right now. And then like a song like Teela or something, you'll hear like. And then slow it again. So now it's just like, like cool. it's just going like yep. that. So. But the, the, the way he used it in 99 was I think he had this on like most of the time. Because okay. like, you'll just hear that kind of like groan, it's, it's that, that kind of like grindy Hammond sound. Mm -hmm. but it's super unique. So if you like do free, you know, like. Like that, that. It's got yeah, it's got a real characteristic to it that if you if you don't have it on, it's just not there. And just like, uh... and it's it's additive. 
Yeah, so it's a that's, mix. That's always on. Yeah, and like, this is on sometimes. Yeah, if, if I here, if I turn this all the way down, you'll just hear the Leslie. It's just, like, it's just kind of like a, it's a very trebly, like Got shimmery it. sound. Yep. So you need this bottom end. Got it. To um to fill out the bass. Makes sense. And then the last piece I think is the is the boomerang. Is the boomerang. Yeah. So the boomerang is. He still has it on, in his rig, and I think this is from the, this is like the second version they made or something like that, but, you know, it's like. And you can make it go backwards, like that. Um, oh, let me show you this. So like, so this is the old um, heavy things. This yeah. is the thing a lot of people wanted to know about. So in Heavy Things, uh, he had to sing and play at the same time. So the way he would do it was record this high note. So you got it on yeah, once so, here. Yeah, so right? if I play well, if I play it like that, I'm just going to play it over yes. and over. But he, he, got, he wanted to sing it like it was like a rhythmic thing, right? And I never understood how they sunk it together because, you know, that's kind of hard to do, like play to a loop, particularly one that's going like every quarter note. And yes. then... That realized now that it's on that, that button. Yeah, so uh, so he had his guitar tech then, uh, Brian Brown, modify this little thing. This is not stock. So uh, I copied it. It's basically this. It's 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 all it's doing is running two wires off of this internally to this. Right, right. Track. So you're just like closing. Yeah, the, it's literally okay. just doing the same thing. And then this is a little Boss foot pedal that. That's just doing and it just the becomes, same thing. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah, and he only did it because he had to. He had to play heavy thing. You know, like and then that. it's always going to be in time because he's literally tapping it the entire song. Yeah, it's, it's, it okay. just becomes like a sample pad. Okay. That's just pretty funny though. But it was it was a fun little mod to do. That is cool. Yeah, you just interrupted this this this. Button. Yeah, you're, you're literally just doing the same. I soldered to cool. the same jacks as so it's literally doing the same thing as as that button. And this guy is getting even though he's on the floor, he's part of the rack switch. Yeah, it's a, it's in a loop. It's in a loop. And it, everything that comes before it can be captured in this loop. Yeah. Right? Yep. So if I was to do like a, like a turn on. You could capture all of that funk. So it's like all the same effects. It's really cool. And then you could play over it. So that that's fun and like you know with the DM2000 you get all these loops going with like you know layers Well, the, yeah, the problem is you have to, you have to remember. Well, it's like, you, well, you have, have to you turn have to, them on. Well, you record. have to remember what's, what's yeah. in the chain because if I do a DM2000 loop first, if I get like a drone going in that, I can't do boomerang stuff because it's going to capture the. Right, because the boomerang's after yeah, that. Yeah, the boomerang's after. So like okay. he had to be very mindful okay. of like what's in the chain, which obviously he was because, you know, this is built up over years and years. Wow. Uh, just a couple little things. This little isolator is just because what you had noise on the output of this thing. Yeah, basically they, these are uh, like loop ground hum eliminators. There are actually three of them in the rig. You I can't saw one see up them. here. Yeah, there's one up here. There's one outside out of the boomerang, and then there's one that's going to each amp. The, the idea yeah. is that in like a you know semi complex guitar system like this, there's a lot of like those wall warts and yeah. you know that create a lot of like electrical um, electrical noise in these in all these guitar cables. So you know, Bob Bradshaw, who built all this custom audio electronic stuff, is the one who built these little things. They're, it's completely passive, so there's no power to it. And um, it works. Like if you took it out of the yeah, you'd hear, like, you'd hear like a tinier, okay. like a little hum or something. Um, yeah, they're really cool. They're very hard to find. <laughs> Pretty much anything that came up on Reverb that was that I bought over the last like two years. Uh, and also, this oh, yeah. is a um, a reproduction of Trey's rack. So his his rack that he had in '97 was called a Crizcraft rack, and uh, they're, they didn't go out of business, but they got bought by a company um, called Encore Cases, and they sell what's called a replica 
of a Crizcraft, but it's, it's pretty specific. It's got these special like handles on the front and front and back. And I basically, I basically had to study all these pictures to figure out how, how many rack units these are. These are rack units, like they're called 1U or 2U. Um, and I figured out it's, it was 18U, and then it has four inch casters, which mm -hmm. are the wheels. And then I had to figure out how deep it was, mm -hmm. so I had to look at pictures of that. But it came from California, and it's so cool. It's, it's sort of specific, too, because I, I know like most rack things like this, like this has like a face right that that latches, oh, latches like this in, yeah. right and that's mm -hmm. specific like i feel like the rest of them just have like a front and you kind of yeah, latch yeah, it from exactly. the side yep. right yeah yeah they're they're kind of like inset so they uh they fit right in they kind cool. of like fit it so you have to you also have to when you give them the specs they want to make sure that like it's actually going to fit and your like knobs aren't going to hit right that. so this all this stuff has to be back enough that when the face goes on with it's probably got it actually foam closes on it or something. Yeah. okay yeah it's two big pieces of i think it's birch plywood or something like that and this thing is just leaning up against here. Like there's no, other, the door, the wheels are locked. Yeah, the wheels are it. locked. Okay. Exactly. Yep. And then this speaker cabinet is a reproduction of the, the old eighties cabs that Trey had built that Paul Languedoc built. And, um, it, not, not, everyone always asks me like, well, what's coming out of that? And in this rig, nothing's coming out of it. You it's could, literally just there as a prop, but it is a fully functional speaker cabinet. If you interrupted this, the speaker out of this you could drive these speakers with it yeah technically but that's it's wired for 16 ohm it's two oh, okay. eight ohms and yeah. that i think this is only set for, it can only do eight ohms yep. and i think you can technically do it but it's probably bad for a vintage sure. amp to run so these were actually driven by this yeah so back point. in the day yeah. yeah so i what i'll eventually do is do a, like a 94 setup so mm -hmm. you'd have the the mesa was actually in the rack and then or well, he had a bigger rack a different one and then he had the speakers on both sides yep. so i have the other one over here Yep. And then, so we had speakers on both sides and then, yeah, it was powered by this. This was rehoused and put in a rack or in this No, he had, he just had this like custom wooden rack Whoa. and it had two Mesa heads in it. Whoa. So I guess he had one as like a primary and one as a okay. backup. Yep. And he didn't have any sort of Leslie effect back then. Um, and then in like 90, fall 97, he still had like the left and right and he had this on top of it. Mm -hmm. So if you look at anything from 97, well, I'll actually in, in summer 97, he was, uh, the, he was running a, Custom Audio Electronics preamp and uh, Groove Tubes power amp. Yep. And he didn't have this yet. So yeah, he, this was on top, and that you'll see that's like a famous tray setup, and I'll, I'll eventually do that when I have all the gear, someday. Sick. But yeah, that's it. Anything else? I, I think we think, covered everything. I feel right? like we covered everything. Pretty sweet. You should play it. You should play it out. Yeah. <laughs>